I think the cost of living crisis is something that everybody's concerned about. Uh, I think the rise in food prices and in energy prices, the highest in over 40 years, is something none of us have experienced, or you know, certainly not for a couple of generations. Mm. And um, we thought we had a sense of how people were being impacted. You know, there's been a lot of stories about cost of living crisis, but actually, I've got a team of five writers, and I, together with them, have been going out and meeting people on the breadline. And what we've discovered is truly harrowing and searing. Mm. Well, let's talk about some of those stories, some of those case studies, uh, some of those things you've uncovered then. Because in London, you know, we've done a few things over the past few months. It's coming up to a year now. We've We've been in a real issue with all this, and, and it is very stark out there, particularly in the capital. Tell us about some of the people you've been speaking to and, and who will feature in today's evening standard that you can pick up anywhere. So one of the people that features is a mother of seven, Jennifer Jones, who in 2016 became disabled. She, she was working before and she had a pretty normal life. But um, the biggest boon to her life was when friends clubbed together and bought her an electric mobility scooter, and she was able to now move around London. Mm. But with the rise in energy bills, she faced such a steep increase that her bills were no longer affordable, and so she stopped charging her scooter overnight as she used to, and just did it for a few hours. And this has led to her running out of charge in the middle of the high street. So she's going along, suddenly it flashes red on the energy gauge. Next thing it's run out, and she is there in tears, very vulnerable, having to rely on a fast food restaurant to charge her up. Then we've got other mothers who um, are having to tell their children, look, we can't afford to put on the heating, you know, um, uh, gowns, pajamas, slippers, just rug up, um, no money for treats, washing yeah. machine breaks down, but you've got a bad tooth, now you've got to make a choice. Do you go with the tooth pain or do you fix the washing machine? Yeah. Um, we've met mothers unable to afford uh, furniture for their children, mm -hmm. for their babies. Uh, one was putting their baby to sleep in a drawer because they couldn't afford a cot. Mm -hmm. Others unable to afford a regular supply of nappies, so changing the baby's nappies much more irregularly than they should be. Yeah. Um, really quite shocking examples. Mm. Well, we've chatted across this table a number of times about campaigns the Evening Standard have been doing. Uh, there was homelessness in the capital, we've, we've done um, getting young people into employment. And you always speak to these people to try and illuminate this, the issue at hand, such as you mentioned there, Jennifer. Is this the worst you've seen it when it comes to these campaigns in terms of trying to uncover these people and tell their stories? Are these some of the most stark images of London and how desperate the situation financially is for so many of these people since you started working as campaigns editor? I think that I've never seen it so widespread. Mm. So um, I would, you know, I'm used to going into estates and seeing pockets of extreme poverty. But um, uh, some of the things that we are seeing, the sort of sacrifices that mothers are making, and also particularly hits very people who are quite vulnerable. So we tell the story today of Candace, who's been skipping meals. Now, a lot of mothers you meet skip meals. They say the hunger really eats at you, but you get used to it. But in Candace's case, she's diabetic, and mm -hmm. she skipped meals and ended up in A&E because her medication requires her to have food with her medication. Mm -hmm. So you, you see these sort of cases of you know the vulnerable... The, the poverty sort of insidiously creeping up on them and then overwhelming them suddenly. Um, and you're seeing stories as well of, I think it's impacting the stress that parents are under is affecting the way they engage with their children and then the way the children engage with other children. So there's one story of a child who, who, who's told by her friends, oh, you know, we're not playing with you because you're not rich. Mm. And then she comes home and says to her mum, Mum, can you make those tuna sandwiches that you used to give me for lunch and maybe we can sell them so we can become rich? Yeah. And that, these kind of things really 
impact the parents. So the parents sort of taking the hits, but when, the ch when they see the children taking the hits, I think that becomes much harder to bear. Yeah. Well, it's a tough time to get anyone to donate to anything at the moment, because as you say, the issue is so widespread. We're all a bit strapped for cash, so getting people to give money to a cause is a struggling thing, uh, perhaps more than we've ever seen in, in recent years. But also, as you said, because it is so widespread, it's something that touches people more personally, perhaps than any other usual campaign. Often, when you pick up a stand and you might see something about homelessness, you go, well, that doesn't affect me, but it's still, you know, it tears my heart apart. This is something that will really appeal to everyone because everyone knows someone that's going through something particularly bad or themselves are. Yeah, I think we're asking people, we've called it on the breadline. It's our cost of living Christmas appeal. We're doing it in partnership with The Independent and with Comic Relief. So Comic Relief have today pledged a million pounds uh, to get us going. And uh, we're looking for viewers to really pay it forward, if you like, mm. and give generously. Um, because I think the, there is real terror. As, as you, uh, for, for, for most of us, we're having to tighten our belts. But for those that are on the breadline, there is no more slack to tighten. Yeah. And they're looking at this winter to come with a real sense of, of fear and terror as to how they're going to afford these bills, what they're going to cut, what are they not going to have. And um, it's, 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 it's tough. It's tough. It's certainly, I've seen a lot, as you say, and the stories when you drill down and meet the individual people and start to actually see most of the, mother, most of the mothers that I met and interviewed were in tears in mm. those interviews. Yeah. Uh, well, it is good to have such a big organisation like Comet Relief involved, I, I assume. And there's a few things uh, that the money can buy. £10 could help a family of three for a week. That's quite something for uh, London prices. You know, 20, qu 20 quid could buy a winter kit containing a blanket, hat, scarf and gloves. You know, these are all very important things, very basic things, depressingly, that people need right now, isn't it? Very much so. I mean, we've got, you know, you've got um, 75 pounds that can buy um, basically a slow cooker and recipes and cooking sessions for a family. And uh, 100 pounds could get an emergency shopping voucher for a family struggling with the cost of living rises. Um, we, um, I think that w what we're going to be doing is we're going to be giving to organisations uh, in the, working in the community that help and support the most disadvantaged families, both in London and across the UK. And it's these brilliant organisations that people increasingly are turning to and, and relying on. Um, the other thing that I've seen is, that I've not seen before, is the rise of warm centres. Mm. So these are community people, community centres which are basically going to help people get through the winter have given them a place to go where they can be warm, mostly in the day, but also potentially at night, so they don't have to turn on their heating. And, I mean, this is... You know, Wolverhampton have just announced 38 of them. A whole lot of London boroughs have announced them. Yes. Um, one of the organisations we feature today called Guiding Hands in, the, in this piece, yeah. they've just applied for funding to be, um, to, to be created as a warm centre. So that's another thing we're going to be seeing. I think we're going to be seeing some things that we've never seen before. And, um, and in a sense, this, camp this is just the beginning. And so this campaign is incredibly timely. Yeah. And just finally, this is day one, week one. Um, but this is going right up to Christmas, isn't it? And you've got a lot of things planned. Yeah, we've got uh, pieces planned for the next five weeks. We're hoping that some big corporate donors will come through, some big philanthropists that will be able to announce some big, um, big targets. Mm -hmm. As I said, we've started with a million. We're looking at initially to double that. Um, and we're going to be featuring some of the projects that we are hoping the money that we raise will fund, projects that go from uh, food banks supporting people with, who have in, food insecurity, to energy vouchers, to just supporting you know, mothers and children in community centres in all sort of myriad of ways, including um, home libraries, um, and uh, just a, 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 a few dozen organisations that really 
um, are going to make the difference for these people.